Right now, I'm going to spend some time talking to you about stocks. Our investment committee has several models where we invest in individual stock holdings. It's not all mutual funds. Some of what we do is individual stocks. I want you to have a, a, a basic understanding of some of the stock principles that we look at quite often in our investment committee so you can have a good conversation when you need to with a client about some of these principles. With that said, I, I know back in college I took an investment analysis course that was a full semester long, three days a week, hour and a half each of those days. So I could certainly talk you to sleep on all this stuff, go into balance sheets and income statements and all sorts of different ratios. But for now, I just want you to get a good understanding of the basics about stocks. My initials are BWP. Let's say that I was a BWP corporation and I uh, had a nice little business going and I made widgets. And uh, let's say that, that I had total sales in a year of $2 million. Nice little company, I make some widgets. I, I sell $2 million for the product. I grow for a couple years, got $12 million worth of sales. But now I want to go national. I really want to get big. I need to raise money. In order to raise money, I can go to the bank and say, hey, can I borrow $100 million to roll my business out nationwide? And they look at me and they think I'm crazy because I've only got $12 million worth of sales. Who knows, I might be in a building, but it certainly isn't worth enough to back a loan for $100 million. I could issue bonds to investors, but it's hard to raise $100 million worth of bonds. Who's going to loan me that when I've got this much in sales? It's hard to get paid back. Well, one option that I could have is I could go public. I could become a publicly traded stock on the exchanges. When you go public, you're basically selling a piece of your company to the public, to the marketplace you're offering shares of your company in exchange for cash. So I may, I may think of my company as a giant pie. And maybe I want to retain 60% ownership of my company. But maybe what I want to do is I need to raise $100 million. And I'm offering pieces I'm offering 40% of my company in an IPO, in initial public offering. And I'm pricing this piece to be worth $100 million. Now the market might think that's too high, the market might think $100 million is too low, it's hard to say. Investment bankers, it's their job to take this piece of my company and create a market for it out there in the public markets. So an investment banker is going to use a firm like Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and those companies are going to price this portion of the offering and make that offering available to anyone in the public who wants to buy it. And what happens is all of a sudden, as soon as it goes public, this piece of the pie gets divided up into tens of thousands of different pieces. Think back to when Facebook went public, or way back when McDonald's or Walmart or Microsoft went public. The public wanted a piece of those companies, and they bought little slivers. And all the cash that's raised from all of those slivers comes back to me. So I can invest that cash into my company so I can go national. That's ultimately how many companies scale so big so fast, is through some sort of offering to the public. You might hear phrases like secondary offering. If you go public with your whole company right out of the gate, you've got nothing left to sell to the public ever again. So some companies, they'll say, okay, I'm going to give away 40%. Uh, now what I want to do, I sure need some more capital. I'm going to go public in a secondary offering with another 20%. And then they'll go public again with another piece, and then another piece. So if you think about Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and Microsoft, they retained a portion of their company. That's why they're so rich. They'd rather have a small piece 
relatively small piece, but still pretty big. They'd rather have a small piece of a multinational global company than have 100% of a small regional company. So going public is how stocks come to be and how they become traded on the, on the public exchanges. Once a stock goes public, a share price is created. Right? We're going to start getting into some of the analytics right now. You get a good feel for this. Let's say that a share price is uh, $50. And let's say there are 5 million shares out there in the universe. Well, if you take 50 times 5 million, that's, of course, $250 million. That's referred to as the market cap. So if you go to CNBC.com or any other, any other uh, website for financial stocks, you type in a ticker. In this example, we're using BWP. You might see that there's a market cap of $250 million. Now, a company like GM has a market cap of like $43 billion, and ExxonMobil is you know, well north of $100 billion. So the size of the company is referred to as the market cap, the market capitalization. How much capitalization is out there from the marketplace? The market cap is not necessarily the value of the company. For example, BWP... Let's say that I maintained 30% ownership for myself, but had an IPO of 70%. The market cap refers to only the portion of the company that's out there in the marketplace. It only refers to this. Uh, stocks like uh, Facebook, where Mark Zuckerberg has a big piece still, the total comp value of the company is the market cap plus what the owners, the partners still own, that they can always go public with later. The market cap is what's trading out there. So that's the first thing you want to look at, is if it's a 250 to a billion dollar company, that's a small cap stock. Mid cap stocks are, are upwards of one to five, sometimes 10 to 15, depending on your definition. Large cap companies are often over $30 billion market caps. So it just depends. The market cap is a good indication of how big the overall company is out there in the marketplace. So you can't look at a share price and have that be the determination of how big or small a company is. The share price times the number of shares outstanding is ultimately what gives you the market cap. And that's a better determination of how big a company is. I want to talk to you about a really important concept called earnings per share, EPS. Earnings per share is one of those key data statistics that you're going to see a lot of when you look at different stocks. Earnings per share is uh, really the measurement used to determine if a stock is cheap or expensive. The share price has nothing to do with how cheap or expensive a, 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 a stock is. Earnings per share, that multiple, is the key. So let's say you've got BWP Corporation, and then you've got EMAC Corporation. Let's say BWP is priced at $20 a share, and let's say that EMAC is priced at $50 per share. A lot of clients would say, wow, that EMAC stock, that's pretty expensive, and the BWP, well, that's pretty cheap. You can't look at the share price to determine how expensive or how cheap it is. If EMAC has earnings per share, let's say EPS of $20, and let's say BWP has earnings per share of two dollars. 
This means in the course of a year, per share, I have profits of $2 a share. Take all the profits that are out there, divide by the number of shares, you get the profit per share. Another word for earnings is profit. How much did you earn per share? Well, BWP is earning $2 per share on a $20 share price. That is a 10 times multiple. My stock is trading at 10 times earnings. Where EMAC, for example, has $20 of profit on a $50 share price. That's trading at two and a half times earnings. This stock, even though it's a smaller price, is more expensive than this. Because it you're only getting you're getting one tenth profit on your on your share price. And here you're getting two and a half times multiple. The lower the multiple, the cheaper the price. To, to give you a, a quick different analogy, let's say you've got an apartment building. This apartment building is a million dollars. But it only generates $10,000 a year of profit. That's not a good return on the investment. On the flip side, You've got another building that's, uh, that is uh, $2 million, but it generates $500,000 of profit. I'm using an extreme example. You can see how investing this to get this much profit is a great deal relative to investing this and getting this much profit. Even though this is more expensive in terms of dollars to buy it, the valuation of the property relative to its profits is much lower. So this has what's called a lower valuation relative to its profits, relative to its earnings. So this is a low valuation. This is a high valuation. You have to look at the earnings per share and the relative multiple to know how good of a deal it is, how cheap it actually is in the marketplace. You're going to run into that a lot. A company like, uh, like uh, Starbucks right now is trading at a multiple of over 400 times earnings. Amazon actually trades at a negative earnings per share multiple. They've actually never made a profit, ever as of today, 2014. A company like Walmart trades at a multiple in the teens. Okay, so different sectors have different multiples that are normal for their sector. So it's important to know what the multiple is and also what the normal multiple is inside the sector. All right, I know that's a lot of stuff to talk about, but just know that earnings per share is a key measurement and ultimately, the valuation of a company is measured in its multiple relative to its earnings. If you ever take the multiple times the earnings per share, that's always what gives you the share price. When you're looking at stocks, the other thing you want to look at a lot is the yield. And by now, by, by going uh, through some of the other videos, you may have already heard of yield. But just to give you a quick synopsis, Let's say you've got a $100 stock price that's paying a $3 dividend. That stock has a 3% yield. So dividend is expressed in the form of dollars. Yield is expressed in the form of percentages. $3 dividend, 3% yield. That's really important. Now, Going back to earnings per share, I'm just building off a couple concepts here. Let's say that here we are again with BWP. Let's say that the earnings per share for this company is $2. Well, if, if I'm paying a $3 a year dividend, but only earning $2 per year, 
That means I'm not even bringing enough profits in to fully cover my dividend. You might say, well, where's the dividend come from? Well, in theory, I have a big bucket of cash as part of my company, and I'm taking my profits plus dipping into cash to come up with the dividend. On the flip side, go the other way. Let's say my earnings per share was $6 and my dividend was still 3 In this example, my earnings per share fully cover my dividend. And this is said to have, a, in this case, a 50% payout ratio. So if my earnings per share are 6 and my dividend that I'm paying my investors is 3 I'm paying out 50% of my profits to my investors. So my payout ratio is 50%. High growth companies tend to trade at higher multiples because there's more upside. For example, a, a small regional restaurant like Buffalo Wild Wings was 10 years ago has lots of upside, lots of growth opportunity so investors are willing to pay a higher multiple to earnings and allow the stock to grow into itself. Whereas a company like Walmart, which is extremely saturated, especially in the United States, there's not as much growth opportunity, so it's going to trade at a lower multiple because it's already grown into itself. It's already, it's already realized its true value in the marketplace. So value company versus growth company. A value company will trade at a lower multiple. A growth company will trade at a higher. In general, a value company will pay out a higher dividend. Because once you've grown, you, you need to put the profit somewhere. And if you're not growing anymore, you pay out a dividend and you become kind of a value stock. Fairly priced, you've grown into yourself, you're paying a dividend. A company like Amazon right now, or, or some of these other companies that aren't paying any dividend, they're reinvesting in themselves constantly so they can grow. They're a growth stock. They're not going to pay a dividend often because they don't want to pay the investor. They want to invest in themselves so they can grow into their multiple. And that's why you get differences between growth and value. Comes down to earnings per share, comes down to that multiple, comes down to the dividend. And that's why you see different stocks classified different ways. I know this is a lot of numbers, but now you know when you get to the mutual fund segment of this training, a large cap value versus large cap growth is going to own different types of stocks for different reasons. Large cap value will have different multiples and dividends. Large cap growth will have different multiples and dividends. It's important to have both, but now you kind of understand some of the differences between them and how to value them appropriately. Again, research this stuff online, ask good questions, watch this video a few times. These are very important core fundamental concepts you need to understand.